my honor today to introduce Jim Kavanaugh to you for this presentation. Jim was elected a Douglas County Commissioner in 2014. He is here today in his role as a presenter with the Nebraska Humanities Council Speakers Bureau, where he begins his 20th year as a speaker. Because of his passion for the people and the history of our community, he is even donating his fee from the Bureau to our Historical Society. Please welcome our County Commissioner and Irish historian, Jim Kavanaugh. Thank you, Cindy. <clears throat> And uh, thank you all for coming out uh, today. I want to thank uh, the Douglas County Historical Society uh, for inviting me to uh, present today on the Irish in Omaha. I want to thank the uh, Humanities Nebraska uh, for underwriting my presentation, uh, which will be donated to the Douglas County Historical Society. And I want to thank um, the College of St. Mary and the Sisters of Mercy, who all uh, referred to again here in a minute, uh, for allowing us to uh, have this in their uh, beautiful facility. Um, as Cindy indicated, I'm a lifelong Omahan, <clears throat> uh, fifth generation Omahan. The first Kavanaugh's came uh, to Omaha in 1855. Omaha was founded in 1854. Uh, so we've been here for a while. And um, it's interesting that like a lot of families, <clears throat> um, I also am a result of recent immigration. My mother's people, uh, the Munnelly family, uh, came to Omaha in 1916, just a little over 100 years ago, uh, as uh, political refugees from uh, Ireland during the War of Independence. As my grandfather would always say, I had a disagreement with the British Empire. <laughs> and so they were compelled to, to leave. Um, we will uh, go through the history of the Irish in Omaha as quickly as possible. And I hope at the end, we'll have a little time for uh, some questions and answers. Um, we are video in this presentation, uh, which will also uh, be donated to the Douglas County Historical Society. Um, and uh, we will post it online as well uh, for those people who are unable uh, to join us here today. I appreciate everybody coming out, keeping social distancing and masking today in light of the pandemic. It's just uh, best practices and good public health. Thank you. The, um, Technology here, which is not my strong suit, requires me to advance the <laughs> PowerPoint. <clears throat> I'll attempt to do that. There we go. One down. <clears throat> On July 4th, 1854, Omaha was founded. It was founded because this man, James Ferry, operated the ferry between Council Bluffs and Omaha. Ferry's Ferry brought the official delegation from Council Bluffs to Omaha on that day, and the ceremony was conducted on the hill that is currently occupied by Central High School. James, born in Ireland, and his wife, Margaret Donnelly Ferry, also born in Ireland, I believe in Donegal, um, also were the parents of the first European American born in the city of Omaha, Margaret Ferry born in late 1854. Margaret Ferry and the Ferries uh, and their descendants are buried at Holy Sepulchre Cemetery in Omaha, and you can visit their graves. They're kind of up by the Crichtons and the Kavanaugh's at the top of the hill. The city of Omaha, as I indicated, founded on July 4, 1854, um, was not quite this expansive in 1857 when you see this map. However, it did have, and I'm going to try to do this, an area right down here um, that was known as Gopher Hill. And this area, which is about uh, da, 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 11th and 
Howard Jackson. Uh, if you know the current O'Keefe Elevator uh, headquarters, uh, that's where this was, uh, was the Irish neighborhood in Omaha from the beginning. The Irish were the laboring classes. Everything that was built in early Omaha was built with Irish labor. And the scarcest thing to uh, come by in construction in Nebraska in those days was wood. Uh, there wasn't much wood here when people got here. And the first thing they did was cut it all down and burn it for heat. So everything that had to be constructed had to be imported and put up by the, uh, the Irish laborers. This, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. This required um, the Irish, who didn't have wood for homes, to tunnel into that hill, to literally make tunnels to live in, hence Gopher Hill. Uh, and uh, the first facilities that were uh, built, we'll come to in a second, uh, were a combination hotel state capital, built by the Irish. Um, they also, because they were land-hungry immigrants, most of them, uh, filed claims on what was then pretty much free country uh, from uh, the point of view of uh, purchasing from, directly from the federal government. And they had their first run-in uh, with the Native American society, many of which you would recognize because streets are named after them in Omaha. And this is a famous case that occurred during this period, 1854, 55, 56, um, where what became known as the Omaha Claim Club, basically vigilantes from Council Bluffs, um, would take uh, Irish immigrants who had filed claims on property and force them to sign quick claim deeds. This particular case involved a man named Callahan who was taken down to the Missouri River and repeatedly dunked this time of year in the river through the ice until he uh, agreed to uh, file a quick claim deed. Mr. Callahan does not have a street named after him, but a lot of the people who did the dunking do. Just to give you some idea of our founding was not exactly as the storybooks would lead you to believe. One thing that the Irish did accomplish was the building of this structure, Omaha's first territorial capital building which also doubled as a hotel. It was essentially the first building built in Omaha, Nebraska, and it would have been down kind of where the ConAgra campus is now. Um, this was a two-story uh, structure. Part of it was brick, part of it was timber. Um, it served as the inaugural venue uh, for the first commemoration of the territory of Nebraska's establishment in the winter of 1854-1855, during which time this brand new building, which had just been finished, <coughs> had muddy footprints all over the ground floor ballroom. And so the um, powers that be hired, again, Irish uh, people, to scrub the floors, which they did, uh, so that they could hold the inaugural ball, which the Irish were not invited to. Uh, <coughs> they did. The ball was held <coughs> in this freezing cold building on an ice-covered ballroom floor. <laughs> and there are some characterizations, we don't have them here today, of the uh, hoi polloi slip sliding across uh, to the punch bowl on the, uh, on the floor of the Capitol. <coughs> this gentleman, uh, Bishop Jean-Baptiste Mige, was arguably the first bishop of Omaha. Omaha didn't have an archdiocese, didn't have a diocese, didn't really have a parish. Uh, and Bishop Mige, uh, who was from France, uh, out of St. Louis, had general jurisdiction over an area that they called um, the territory of the Aborigines and Savages. Uh, and uh, he appointed uh, the first Kavanaugh to come to Omaha, Father John Kavanaugh, who sadly we don't have a picture of, uh, who was the first parish priest at the first church uh, in Catholic Church in Omaha, also the first church in Omaha. The reason that the Catholic Church was the first church, although the Catholics, predominantly Irish, were not the ruling class at Omaha at that time, was that the Irish laborers refused to build anything else after the Capitol was built until their church was built. 
And so in order to get the other things that the uh, ruling class wanted to have built, they were forced to build what became known as St. Mary's Church, again, on the site of what is today the ConAgra uh, campus. Bishop Meege, at the um, suggestion of Archbishop O'Malley of Chicago, appointed Father John Cavanaugh as the first parish priest of that, and the first baptisms were held there in uh, 1855. Records still exist of those. Um, the first actual bishop of this area of Omaha uh, was Bishop James O'Gorman from 1859 to 1874, which was a huge era in the growth of our city. Um, in 1857, the Creighton family comes to Omaha, and there's an explosion of activity because with them comes the telegraph, which actually brought them here. And in the 1860s, the Union Pacific Railroad comes to Omaha, largely, again, built by Irish labor. And so these uh, first bishops, and you'll see a list here in a second, were all Irish guys. And uh, this was true of the, um, the top of the clergy, but it was true all the way down to the uh, parish priest, a la Father uh, Kavanaugh. Um, it was also true of the Sisters of Mercy, uh, founded by um, Mother Macaulay in Dublin in 1831, one of the first religious orders to come to Omaha, and they were uh, designed to educate women. Uh, Mother Macaulay felt that highly educated women were the only way that you could have a healthy society. This institution, if you go out to the uh, road, has that quote of Mother Macaulay's uh, on, the, on the entranceway. Uh, I know this because numerous women, highly educated from my family, uh, were educated by the Sisters of Mercy in Omaha, Nebraska. And they do a spectacular job. Uh, so between Bishop O'Gorman and the Sisters of Mercy, uh, the Catholic Church uh, started building off of St. Mary's Parish to expand into Omaha. Um, the Sisters of Mercy were the uh, first order to found a hospital in Omaha. And Bishop O'Gorman, followed by Bishop O'Connor, Bishop Scannell, Bishop Hartley, I think Rummel was a German, uh, Bishop Ryan, Bishop Bergen, Bishop Sheehan, and uh, down to modern times. Uh, was one in a long series of bishops who uh, built a lot of things. Under his tutelage were the Creighton family. Uh, now the Creightons came to Omaha, as I indicated, in 1857, uh, primarily because they were in charge of building uh, the um, telegraph from coast to coast. Omaha was, for a brief period of time, the only way that you could get a message from New York City to California. Imagine if you had the only email that could send a message from New York City to California. You might be able to make a couple bucks doing something. The Creightons were responsible for that, and in exchange for their labor, they didn't take fees so much as they took stock in Western Union, which made them spectacularly wealthy. Uh, you know, you could compare them in their day to uh, Warren Buffett in our day in terms of the comparative wealth that these people possessed uh, in the 1860s, 1870s, and on. Edward Creighton, who was the uh, founder of the Klan in Omaha, they're from Ohio originally and from Monaghan back in the old country, uh, set up many, many of our institutions, including Creighton University upon his death as a bequeath by his wife, Mary Lucretia Creighton. So Creighton College, as it was called, was established in 1873 as a school for boys. Uh, as the Sisters of Mercy were educating the young uh, women, mostly Irish, uh, the Jesuit order uh, educated the young men, again, mostly Irish. Um, I was a product of Jesuit education and both Creighton Prep and Creighton University, and they still do a great job down to this day. Ed Creighton's young brother, who, <laughs> he doesn't look too young here, but he was 11 years younger than Ed, um, Count John Creighton, he got a Count title from the Catholic Church. Uh, established not only Creighton University, but uh, 
many of the, uh, what we would today call not-for-profit organizations in early Omaha, uh, helping the poor, uh, the disabled. Um, St. Joe's Hospital, uh, which I was born in, uh, was established under his uh, generosity. And he lived to a pretty good age, uh, passing away in 1907. And this is the university back at its foundation. That building, if you go on campus, still exists. If you go behind the current administration building, you'll see what looks like kind of an add-on. That's that building built in the 1870s, uh, initially for um, kind of high school age boys, then expanded to uh, university, and uh, ultimately uh, expanded to include uh, men and women. This is Count Creighton's funeral, which may still hold the record for the largest funeral in the history of Omaha. You'll see that church, again, St. John's Church, still exists in the heart of Creighton's campus. Many of you, I'm sure, have been there. Uh, and this is the count being taken out by Hefe and Hefe Mortuary, which we'll hear a little bit more about, uh, which has planted more of the uh, Irish in Omaha than uh, probably all the other mortuaries combined. And we'll hear a little bit about that in a second. This is the uh, Creighton family. I don't know that that date is exactly right because it's three years after he died and he's pictured in the front row. <laughs> if it is, he's in remarkably well-preserved and my hats are off to the heafies. Um, but the Creightons, like many of the prominent families that we'll touch on, um, were extremely uh, wealthy and not prolific. Um, Ed Creighton and John Creighton had no surviving children. And so all the Creightons that came after them were um, what you would call cadet lines of that family, nieces, nephews, cousins. And today there are very, very few Creightons. I know a couple uh, by that name in Omaha. This is true of many of the families that we'll study here uh, this afternoon. And it's an interesting phenomenon. This is proof that we have been here since the beginning, uh, founded this city, basically. The earliest and longest ongoing ethnic celebration in Omaha is the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Now, I'm a Hibernian, and I probably imagine there's a few Hibernians in the hall here, lady Hibernians. Um, <clears throat> in 1873, this appeared in the newspaper, and all the newspapers, commemorating the first ethnic parade of any kind for any group in the history of Omaha. Uh, and you can go down to the library, and it's fascinating to go through the old stacks of paper and find these. But this says, the Green Banner celebration of St. Patrick's Day in this city, fine music, a grand procession, a living picture, and other features. Uh, you pretty much could take that headline and run it this March, and it would pretty much cover, hopefully, what we'll see again uh, on St. Patrick's Day. Um, this goes on to talk about the procession, which was to be the first feature of the day celebration, formed at 10 o'clock and moved to the Catholic Cathedral, where Grand Pontifical High Mass was performed by the Right Reverend Bishop O'Gorman, assisted by several priests, followed by a sermon from Father Burns, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it was a big deal then, and it's a big deal now, and I invite you all to come out. I'm gonna talk a little bit more, time permitting, about this year's celebration uh, at the end of my remarks. General John O'Neill, uh, the father of O'Neill, Nebraska, Atkins, Nebraska, Greeley, Nebraska, uh, originally from Monaghan, the O'Neills are the royal family of the north of Ireland, uh, came to uh, the US like many of us did because of the uh, Irish famine of 1846 to 1850 uh, and had a distinguished military career in the uh, Civil War fighting for the Union, after which um, he helped found the Irish Republican Army. That phrase, the Irish Republican Army, the IRA, was John O'Neill's invention. And in 1867, uh, units of the Irish Republican Army invaded Canada. 
<laughs> from upstate New York and points in New England. And the idea, fostered by John O'Neill, was that the Irish would take some or most or all of Canada and uh, hold it hostage <laughs> until the British Empire granted Ireland their independence. And they were successful initially. Uh, they fought a famous battle, Ridgeway, um, where they beat back the British forces. And they were about ready to press on when General Grant, then President of the United States, said, you know, this might precipitate a war between the United States and the United Kingdom. So maybe we should ask these gentlemen to come back across the river. He wasn't interested in doing them in because they were all distinguished veterans of the Civil War, but he was interested in avoiding an international uh, incident that could result in war. And so the first invasion of Canada um, was called off and the uh, invaders came back. This was repeated on three subsequent occasions over the next three years. So between 1867 and 1870, <clears throat> units of the Irish Republican Army, headed by General John O'Neill, invaded Canada from the United States. There's some interesting literature on this, and I, I urge you all to look at it, because after his uh, unsuccessful attempt to hold Canada hostage for the independence of Ireland, um, General O'Neill turned his energies, which were considerable, to the immigrant problem, which was the Irish would get to the United States penniless, many of them ill or in bad health, uh, and they would be stuck on the East Coast in tenements that were unhealthy. Most of these people had never been in cities before. Most of these people were farmers. And at this period of time, the Homestead Act is in effect, and they were giving away free land in places like Nebraska. And so he thought, if we made it possible for the immigrants on the East Coast to come out here and become farmers in the Midwest, uh, they would realize the American dream. And so thousands did, and you can still find their families in O'Neill, Nebraska, Atkinson, Nebraska, Greeley, Nebraska, and descendants of them here in Omaha. That was all John O'Neill's doing. And unfortunately, um, he contracted pneumonia in 1878 uh, and was treated at St. Joseph's Hospital, um, staffed by the Sisters of Mercy, and succumbed. And you can find his grave uh, at the top of the hill in um, Holy Sepulchre Cemetery as well. Ben Gallagher is one of the ex 